Shalom and welcome to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and as we do on the last Monday of every month at the 12 o'clock p.m. hour, Central Standard Time, we bring you uh, this time with Faith Blatchford, author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation. Uh, <clears throat> we have to come up with some catchy name uh, for this segment. Um, we're going to work on that, Faith. I, I might toss that to you to come up all with. Right. But welcome to the program. Thank you, Eric. It's great to be with you and all your viewers. Well, we're excited. We covered the release of the book uh, back on July the 4th when it came out, uh, 2017. We were so interested in this idea of sleep that we invited you to be a regular contributor. You were here with us in August for your first segment as a regular contributor to the program Revealing the Truth. And now, next one, so you're becoming family, a part of the team here, uh, the yeah. part of the cast of, uh, of thousands, hundreds, six uh, that we yeah. have, and we're very <laughs> delighted to have you. Uh, tell me, you're getting now, the book's been out there for a couple months, people are reading it. Uh, it's had some impact, and you've heard some pretty stunning testimonies that have uncovered for you some of the global issues with sleep. And I want you to share with our audience one of the emails you just got from somebody that you said 55 years they've been struggling with insomnia? Yes, 55 years. I mean, wow. that's, that's more than a lifetime, you know, when you're suffering like that. And uh, one of the aspects is always anxiety and fear, fear of the dark and just general fear. And so this lady said, wrote me and she said as she began reading through the book, I think she said by the time she got to chapter five, she had been so impacted that she has no longer, she's no longer experiencing any issues. She's sleeping. So that is a tremendous testimony and testimony do it again lord you know for all the people watching and listening that because it's a it's a horrific problem in in globally not just in the US but worldwide i think statistically 90% of the people who experience insomnia experience anxiety or that's the clinical term we just call it plain old fear and it's true globally western europe the middle east statistics show maybe a little less anxiety but still way up there 80 percent wow i'm um it, it makes me appreciate my sleep patterns so much more i i fall asleep my head pits, hits the pillow i go to sleep i get seven seven and a half hours every single night without fail unless i'm fighting an infection and then my sleep is interrupted and mm -hmm. the first time it's interrupted my mind plays with the idea of wonder what's bothering me that I'm up so I go to look at all my circumstances in life I go to look at all the pressures I go to look at the, the ministry the network people maybe this is a time of intercession Lord what is it you want me to and I don't recognize immediately that I might be fighting an infection mm -hmm. then the second day um, I, um, it occurs to me I don't feel right, but I always attribute that to not having a good night's sleep. Mm -hmm. The third night, I then realize, oh, maybe I'm getting like a sinus infection, or and I have those recur over the years. Had them as a kid, mm -hmm. probably one a year. Get have a regular routine. So then I start on an antibiotic and all of a sudden my sleep pattern and by the third night I'm struggling with I hope I can go to sleep right I really hope I'm not gonna stay up tonight I really it's now three days and my sleep mm -hmm. is just completely interrupted and I'm so far off my pattern that that breeds its own form of anxiety Absolutely. related to a pattern of thought about being anxious about falling asleep and I'm a regular great 360 two, 363 days of the year, I am rock solid, sleep through the night, don't wake up, don't have a problem, 
happy to go to sleep, like my bed, like my pillow, uh, <laughs> like my environment. So I can see where anxiety uh, can really play a part in disrupting sleep patterns. Yes, and it's, it's not just anxiety in the mind, but anxiety in the body as well. You know the scripture in Matthew that Jesus said men's hearts failing them for fear. And I think this, I don't think that was just a, a mind thing. I think that we can look at a lot of the causes of heart trouble and find out that there is an element of anxiety that is, has become a physical reality in somebody and it affects our heart. So it's not just the mind, not just the body, but then it's a spiritual dimension as well. I think that's why, you know, the Bible uses the word fear 365 times, and there are 144 verses that say, fear not. So God, our wonderful Heavenly Father, knew that at least, you know, every couple of days, we were going to need that word, sweetie, fear not. It's okay. I'm your daddy. I got you. But uh, one of the things, I think there are probably three different types of fear that affect people at night. And one is this nebulous fear of the darkness, which I deal with probably almost a whole chapter in the book. And the second one is fear of criminal activity. Studies have been done that reveal that a lot of people's fear, some people won't even get out of bed and go to the bathroom because they're afraid of some robber breaking into the house. And the third is when you think about what people are dealing with in their mind, it is fear of the future. It's fear, what's going to happen to my finances? What is this phantom pain that I'm having? Do I have cancer? What about my children? But it's all foreboding, fear of the future. And that's where God's word, once again, you know, Jesus said, listen, don't worry, have, take no thought for tomorrow. Why? Because your heavenly father knows what you need. So the key is Thank God for pills and medication. Thank God for self-talk and changing our brain. But most of all, it's the spiritual dimension, the God factor. You know, when you're talking about fears and scripture, when God says fear not, I'm reminded in the Greek there's three, three names for love. Mm -hmm. Just three. Mm -hmm. But in the Greek, there are over 2,500 different named phobias and fears. There's a fear of peanut butter sticking to the roof of your mouth. There's a fear <laughs> of chickens. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a fear of the Pope. It's, it's, it's uh, uh, popophobia or, or popophobia or something. Right. There is, uh, um, listen to this one. Hippopotamus strosacupedaliophobia. That's the fear of long words. We <laughs> have so many fears that uh -huh. they have the top 100 uh, listed on the fearof.net. We have mm -hmm. glorified fear in this country. I am a yes. blackout curtain. I mean, I have two layers of blackout curtains. I like mm -hmm. it when it is pitch black. It's so dark in my room at night that the light from the green light from the smoke detector gives off enough light that I can almost read a book. And it's way oh. up on the top of the ceiling, but it's the only light that breaks the darkness. And I have yes. to remind myself, don't look at that light because you want to throw something at it. I want to climb a tall ladder and put a Band-Aid over it. It, it bother. So hotel rooms, I go in, I have clips for the curtains. And yes. I have, I take extra business card because my business card's a tent, and I put it in front of all the lights that are yep. in the room to try to block all this light because I like to sleep in a cold, 
dark room. Yes. I have no fear of the mm -hmm. boogeyman or fear of somebody breaking in. Uh, none of that. Uh, you know, interesting that you should talk about that because just this last week I was in another city and I was staying in a hotel and I am the same. I like it cold and dark in the room. So I'm try you know, turning out all the lights and all the lights are out except the bedside light. And there was this soft glow, very, very soft light. And then there was a switch that you could, a dimmer switch, but it was already on dim. And do you know that light could not be turned off? at all and the cord was way around behind this huge big bed that I couldn't even get to and I thought you know I wonder if this is you know the hotel world catering to the fact that people are so afraid of the dark that there is this night light that is very soft very you know not disturbing to someone who's afraid of the dark they right. feel safe I have never experienced that before yeah, I'm sure that when they come to clean up my hotel room, because I always get when I check in, I ask for extra pillows and extra towels. Now, I don't sleep with extra pillows, and I don't need extra towels, but I use them to drape over the television set. I use them mm. to drape over the, the uh, DVD player. I do it to drape over the clock radio. I do it to drape over those things. Mm -hmm. I do it to clip on to the curtains where the light comes in. It doesn't meet all the way, and I carry binder clips to do this, and so when they come in, I try to take everything down, but it looks like uh -huh. there's all these unused towels. But that's the environment that I sleep in, and if I'm traveling, and mm -hmm. especially like going to Israel, okay, you've got mm -hmm. jet lag, you've got these other things, other influences, and I'm leading tours of Israel every year. I want to get mm -hmm. in that hotel, and I want to create this nest in which I can go right to sleep. And yes. so that's what I do. But, you know, fear, anxiety, and it's interesting because as you're talking about fear and anxiety, I don't think people stop really necessarily during the day to address whether or not they're operating in fear or they have regular anxiety. But it's when they stop. Yes. It's the end of the day. They're mm -hmm. laying down and they're looking for relief. And all mm -hmm. of a sudden this wash comes over them and they realize that they really are anxious, they really are consumed with worry. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if, it's like a baby. You know, I ask when my daughter was born, why do babies cry? Mm -hmm. I wanted to know, why do babies cry? And they said one of the way, reasons babies cry is to let off energy so that they can go to sleep. Mm -hmm. thought to myself, how interesting. Mm -hmm. So my daughter would cry, and I would try to figure out which one. Was she hungry? Was she wet? Mm -hmm. Or did she just need to let it out mm -hmm. so she could self-soothe and go to sleep? Mm -hmm. And a lot of the times it was that. Yes. That she just needed to get it out. So what do you recommend people do to get it out, to take it out of that hidden place? Because I think that sleep associated with darkness, associated with hidden places, that is the most private time that any individual, whether or not they're in a marriage, not in a marriage, they're left alone with their thoughts in mm -hmm. this, these moments as they're preparing to surrender because it is an unknown place. Mm -hmm. There are people that don't wake up and we've instilled in our children that stupid prayer. If I should die before I wake. Oh I my know. goodness, why would you have a four-year-old ever say that? I said that and I said to myself, well, I'm not going to sleep, and I would sit with my arms crossed, and I would sit up in bed, leaning against the pillows as a four-year-old, five-year-old, mm -hmm. six-year-old. If I should die before I wake, well, I'll, I'll, I'll fix that. Yes, if exactly. If sleep is death, I just won't go to sleep. Well, well you know, I think that uh, Jesus always addressed people as little children. And when we think about our children and when they're little and at night, what do most children do when they're afraid at night? Whether parents like it or not, they will hear a knock at the door or sometimes they won't even hear a knock. They will just find this little body 
uh, in bed with them. And the comfort for little children with fear is their parents. And Jesus said, I am never alone. The Father is always with me. And when 1 John 4 talks about perfect love casting out fear, love is not a pill that we take. Love isn't some philosophical concept. Love is a person. And so to have this relationship with our Heavenly Father through Jesus Christ, He is the answer. And there's another scripture in Psalms where David said, When I awake, I am still with you. And the inference is, well, he must have gone to sleep with God if he's still with God when he wakes up. And I think developing this relationship, this awareness that I'm not going to bed just alone with my thoughts, that I have access and presence with me to talk and process and say, Daddy, Father God, Abba, I am so afraid of this pain. I'm so afraid I'm going to lose my job. And allow the comfort and the, the encouraging words, the affirmation from our Heavenly Father to say, Honey, son, daughter, it's okay. Don't worry about tomorrow. I got you. It's going to be okay. When people are reminded of the things that they are afraid of, what, uh, I mean, the, uh, you, my answer and your answer will be the same. Well, they should pray and mm-hmm. take it out of the darkness and into the light and, and speak it to the Lord. Uh, are there prayers that can be tuned just to this particular issue of sleep? Well, it's always... I mean, I think our prayers and our thought life, ideally, is to be founded on and born out of the truth of the Word of God. That's why the scripture talks about being transformed by the renewing of our mind. And so, these wonderful scriptures where the Word of God says, He gives His beloved sleep. The scripture that says, I can lie down in safety because he watches over me. He's with me. He never sleeps, which is why, you know, your image of being four and sitting up, I'm not going to sleep if I'm going to die. Well, the image of Father God watching over us like a a doting father over a crib or a, a child's bed, just He's awake. Nothing is going to happen. And so I think it is the more we can take the scripture from just being black words on a white page to being something that we can actually experience and lay our head on at night and close our eyes and rest. That is very important. Faith, the pharmaceutical world, the -the over-the-counter world has flooded the marketplace with sleep aids. Uh, 40 or 45 percent of all Americans take some form of sleep aid to Mm -hmm. assist in this. Uh, how, How do sleep aids interfere with the work of God? How do they keep us from enjoying the fullness of sleep the fullness of this gift of God and how does it impact our relationship with the Lord if we can't if we're dulled if we're numbed if we're uh, drugged in our sleep can we actually hear see feel uh, revelation from God in this moment when we're in this stupor as opposed to resting in him well I I understand sort of the inference of what your question is, but the interesting thing, because part of what I do is I'm a counselor Mm -hmm. and a pastoral counselor, and so the some of the clients that I have had, the either the client or someone sort of associated with the client has said, you know, they are on heavy medication, and so how 
is this going to work for you to have a prayer healing prayer time with them? And I say, it doesn't matter at all because we are dealing spirit to spirit and any medication, I don't care what it is, the heaviest dose of whatever cannot impact someone's spirit. Now it may impact their brain, it may impact their body, but it will not impact the spirit. So God isn't stopped by whatever medication. What stops it is our ignorance about who God is and what he actually can and wants to do for us. And so God isn't upset about medication. He's not, you know, well, if you'd only quit that, then maybe you'd have a relationship with me. No, it's all about I am available. I am so much more powerful. I mean, when you think about the Gadarene demoniac, and he had legions of demons, and we think, well, demons are more powerful than medication. But that man and his spirit man was able to connect to Jesus. And I think the same is true when we think about if I'm, you know, possessed or controlled by drugs to get to sleep, it's not going to hinder my connection with God. And then God can take care of the physical, mental, emotional issues that are causing me to have sleep issues. You know, it's an outstanding point, and I think people go into this thinking that if I'm drugged, if I'm uh, under uh, the influence of some uh, narcotic or some sleep aid uh, that I can't hear clearly from the Lord, it may be that in your haziness and waking up, you don't have the clarity of what God spoke to you, or in your mm -hmm. your muddled mind that you think that maybe what you saw or heard isn't what you saw or heard. Uh, there's ways that you have for people to process that uh, through nightly declarations, through journaling, through discipline uh, that will assist them in this process. You, we opened the show talking about the woman who for 55 years struggled with insomnia and anxiety and fear and because she read your book, and my question to you would be, what was it about the book that unlocked for her? What was the key that unlocked the door for her to get a grip on this crippling anxiety and fear that kept her from resting in the Lord? She didn't specify, but she did say, I think through chapter 5, and chapter 5 I think is the chapter that deals with fear and the darkness. Mm -hmm. And so the revelation of that in that chapter in the book, uh, truth sets us free. And fear, you know, is the acronym FEAR, F-E-A-R, false evidence appearing real. And so when we get the truth, we just completely blow to smithereens the lies that fear is based on. Yeah, and I like the one F-E-A-R, feeling everything and reacting. And so we, Oh, I we, like that. Yeah, that's, you know, because we are, we're supposed to walk by faith and not by sight. We're not supposed to walk, it's not, uh, feeling is in the soul, not in the spirit. Feeling is in the mind, will, and emotion where we tend to to honor all of our feelings. Mm -hmm. And God's not the God of feelings. He is the God who speaks directly into our spirit. As you said, spirit man, the spirit to spirit connection with God. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Chapter five is my body was designed for sleep. One third mm -hmm. of your life is to be devoted. Mm -hmm. And if you take that eight hours as an adult and then you back into that the first 15 years where you are sleeping 20 hours, 25 hours, it's actually more than a third when you front load it the way you do. Uh, right. It, it, and, and we spend so little time addressing this very important place where we're still long enough 
for God to speak to us, as he did with Joseph, as he did with Abraham, mm -hmm. as he did with Daniel, and so many others. We're talking with mm -hmm. Faith Blatchford about this idea of winning the battle for the night, God's plan for sleep, dreams, and revelation. When we come back, we're going to talk about this concept of biblical encounters with God at night, how you too can position yourself to not only sleep, but to hear from the Lord. Everyone mm -hmm. desires a message. Everyone desires to, to hear and receive a personal message from God. You mm -hmm. can have that. You can have that every night if you prepare mm -hmm. yourself in the way of receiving. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a break and we'll be right back. Shalom. I'm the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, Executive Director of Ignatic Nation and host of the daily TV program Revealing the Truth, seen live every Monday through Friday from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Central Standard Time at www.ianbn.com and then replayed throughout the day and night via our website. All of our segments can be seen on the Ignatia Nation YouTube channel. Since our launch in January of this year, we've expanded our global reach to over 54 countries with a social media following of over 125,000. Our commitment is to bring you the most in-depth interviews with authors, subject matter experts, and thought leaders from around the world. We have interviewed guests from Israel, Brazil, England, India, and all across North America. All of our authors are featured on the books and media page on our website, www.ianbn.com. There you can find a direct link to the book you want to order, and we receive a small commission directly from Amazon. There is no cost to you for this service. In addition to our daily teachings and interviews, we make available to you the archive of all of the interviews on our YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram channels. Our live program is available from our homepage, and there is never a charge to you for any of this access. We made the decision long ago that we would remain a commercial-free resource that would not be influenced by any pressure from any outside company. There are only two ways that we are able to continue to operate this ministry and provide you with the only live, four-hour daily Christian television talk show program. The first is through your support and tax-deductible contributions to Igniting a Nation. These can be made directly through the donate button on the website or sent through the mail to Igniting a Nation, 2700 Corporate Drive, Suite 120, Birmingham, Alabama, 35242. The other way we support the program is by offering you a unique opportunity to have access to over 10 years worth of teachings on a subscription basis. The teaching archives contains all of my prior sermons, Torah studies, prophecy in the news videos, and much more for the low subscription price of $5 per month. This subscription grants you unlimited access to over 800 hours of content not available elsewhere and is updated weekly with the most current prophecy classes. In addition to 20 hours of original TV programming each weekday, we invite you to join us live every Monday, Tuesday, and Thursday evenings for our Prophecy in the News classes. The times and locations are listed on our events page on the website www.ianbn.com. Every day, you and I are faced with the challenge of where we will go to hear the truth. We are committed to bring you the only program of its kind that covers the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. We cannot do this without your support. Since we launched on January 5, 2017, we have aired over 300 individual teachings, interviews, and commentaries not available anywhere else. We are now working side by side with almost every major Christian publishing house to bring you the most in-depth feature interviews possible. Our one-hour features address every subject that affects the believer's life. We are hearing of salvations from the Middle East, Africa, and all across the United States. Lives are being changed every day, and we have only just begun. Our mission is to become your trusted resource and grant you access to the people, 
tools and information you need to grow in your relationship with the Lord. You can help us by liking us on social media and through your financial support. We know you have many choices and who you support, but we are prayerfully asking you to consider helping us keep revealing the truth, true to our calling, to cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth like no other program available. Donate today and help us bring the message to the four corners of the earth. Visit www.ianbn.com and donate, buy a book, or subscribe to our teaching archives. Without you, we do not exist. Shalom and welcome back to this edition of Revealing the Truth, where we cover the headlines, the heartlines, and biblical truth. I'm your host, the Reverend Rabbi Eric Walker, and we're visiting with Faith Blatchford, author of Winning the Battle for the Night, God's Plan for Sleep, Dreams, and Revelation. Faith, welcome back to the program. Thank you. You know, Faith, the reason why we decided we wanted to have this as a regular monthly spot here on the Ignited Nation Broadcast Network and on Revealing the Truth, where we talk about sleep, is because this is universal. Everybody has this in common. Even those mm -hmm. people that believe in other religions, even those right. people that follow Islam or, or Buddhism or Hindu or anything, we all as human beings have to sleep in order to function. Yes. And uh, there was a point in your life when you, you struggled with sleep. You thought you were unproductive if you slept. You thought it was a waste of time and you looked at other people that talked about and you looked at people in the Bible. Five mm -hmm. specific stories of the Bible that all mm -hmm. dealt with sleep and it kind of ignited in you a jealousy. Take us through some of that and what really became this, I don't want to call it a crusade for sleep, but it is almost a crusade. You've got this banner of the Z's. It's just the, mm -hmm. you know, give me a Z, give me another Z, give me another Z. <laughs> <laughs> I can see that. Yes, I can too. Well, you know, I think there are two groups of people who have a sleep deficit, and some of them are the ones, 70 million, are the ones with insomnia. But another, at least 70, 90 million people in the U.S. alone suffer sleep deficit because they are workaholics or they just have no value for sleep. They think it is a waste of time, and that was my story. I mean, I, I didn't suffer with insomnia, and I didn't think I was suffering by only getting four hours of sleep at night. Mm. For me, it was way too much to do, and things I liked to do. It wasn't I was taking work home. I was just interested in everything. And then there was the spiritual dimension of if you're going to be a good Christian, you've got to get up really early and pray, and then I love sports. So I was out on the practice range hitting buckets of g golf balls at five in the morning. Well, you know, burn the candle at both ends. But I, ha I mean, I had no clue of the detriment that it was causing to my health or mental acuity. But I had friends who dreamt and they had historic you know, amazing dreams, and they would keep talking about them, and I had to listen, and I had nothing to contribute, and I didn't like that. So I finally shared with a friend and said, you know, I, I'm actually jealous of you, and she laughed at me, and I was offended at that too, and she said, Faith, you don't sleep enough to dream. Mm -hmm. And so God's hook for me to cause me to look at this topic. I had never heard a sermon, a teaching, anything on sleep in the church. And I'd been a believer since I was 15. And that's a lot of years of going to church and going to conferences. People would talk about dream interpretation. People would, you know, lots of books on that. But never anything on sleep and so meanwhile as I'm beginning to do research on this I'm finding that the secular world because of medical science and all the research showing the problem when people don't get enough sleep the world the secular world is addressing the issue and unfortunately I am not seeing that it's being addressed in the church so I'm, I'm kind of tongue-in-cheek calling myself 
sleep ambassador for God mm. uh, to the church because we're the ones that are entrusted with the earth. We're the ones that need to be getting these downloads, these historic revelations that, like Joseph, I mean, he didn't have the dream. Nebuchadnezzar had the dream that then Joseph interpreted, but what that dream encompassed was a 14-year economic plan that saved the nations. And how many economic plans do we need to save some of the nations and our own nation, some of the economic problems? I think God wants to give this to people in dreams, but as I learned, if you don't sleep, you don't dream. It, yeah, so to position yourself to hear from God in your sleep, you have to sleep a certain amount of hours. Mm -hmm. You have to go through different stages of sleep in order to get to that one stage where we are, I guess, brainwave recipients mm -hmm. um, to hear from God. Right. How, how do we do that? Well, you know, when, pe when you think about your day and people think about, usually we focus on the day beginning in daylight, but actually the scripture says the, in Genesis, the evening and the morning were the first day. And so our day actually begins at night. God wants the first eight hours to repair our body, to equip us for the day. But we spend a lot of time, most people do, in preparing for the daylight day. You know, if we have to be at work at eight, we back up the alarm clock, we set it for six, five, whatever. We spend money on gadgets that will get us up, you know, whether it's iPad or whatever, Echo, um, we spend money on what kind of coffee, if you're a coffee snob, then you spend money on a certain coffee pot and you set it, you know, you catch my drift. I mean, we spend a lot of time and money focusing on preparation for our daylight day. And All I right. think God is kind of changing how we approach the night with this idea we really need to spend time and maybe some money preparing for the day which begins at night and that means if I'm gonna get at least seven hours of sleep I have to set my bedtime and then back it up to going through some kind of routine which partly involves shutting down our electronics and I think the other is to cause us to have reflection. You know, some of the um, monastic, liturgical churches, particularly the monastic orders, which I don't know a whole lot about, but I know they have evening services. I mean, there's this idea of prayer and connection with God before we sleep. And I think that process I don't think God intended for us to deal with the problems of our day to wait until the night. I think people have a lot of bad dreams because they didn't actually spend time with God resolving issues, uh, fears, offenses, failures. They didn't spend time before they went to sleep. And so then they're wasting, I think, some of the precious time that God could be singing over them, could be just loving on them because they're having to process uh, offenses, failures, all that type of stuff. You know, in Judaism, we have Friday night services on the Sabbath and then Saturday morning services. And then we have another service on the evening that the Sabbath ends called Havdalah or Havdalah that is the end of the service. So there's three specific times in which over a 24-hour period, really 25-hour period, you would come before the Lord. Now, I remember mm -hmm. as a child, I would go to my grandparents for Friday nights uh, and spend the weekends with them because I was being trained. 
And so mm -hmm. I would walk to the synagogue with my grandfather on Friday night and Saturday morning. Then I would walk by myself on Sunday to go meet with the rabbi as I was being trained. And mm -hmm. I remember that the nights, and I, you know, you, th you correlate it with sleeping at your grandmother's, you get a better night's sleep. It's, it's, it's more fun there. But mm -hmm. uh, truly, uh, it was the fact that there were services, that, that yeah. we were spending presence with God. And I would, r I would remember, I would hear the liturgy in my mm -hmm. head. I would hear the prayers. And the prayers mm -hmm. are consistent around the world. So it's kind of like you're joining together with the body of faith worldwide mm -hmm. at the mm -hmm. same time uh, 24 hours a day uh, 24 time zones and so mm -hmm. there's this kind of breaking of the atmosphere and this connecting plugging in to a power center that's continuous yes. all throughout this cycle uh, so um, <clears throat> uh, it's just fascinating to me as you make these connections that mm -hmm. um, and it very well may be, and, and we talk about this, and we've talked about this, you know, people tend to think, oh, it's easier to read the Bible in the morning, it's better to read the Bible in the morning, better to read the Bible in the morning, better to mm -hmm. read the Bible in the morning, better to read the Bible in the morning. But <laughs> what about it was the last thing you did at night if you prepared the way? Yes. You set your mind to things above as opposed mm -hmm. to the things below. If the last words on your mind was the psalmist, the last words on your mind was this redemptive plan of God, would that create an environment in our minds as opposed to this, oh, I have to get up in the morning and read my Bible. Maybe mm -hmm. we've been putting people on the wrong path because mm -hmm. their day, it's easy to dedicate your day to the Lord. It's hard in the current environment to dedicate your night to the Lord. Yes. Yes. Faith, do we need to redirect our efforts in that area? Uh, well, I mean, really and truly, this this would be uh, earth changing, world changing if we did this. And I think the enemy is always trying to rob God. I mean, that goes back to the garden. And right. would it be, wouldn't it just be like him if he caused us to focus on the wrong part of the day and then he's co-opted the night through fear so he knows he knows the design of God I mean the scriptures say the demons know the scripture and they tremble so do does the demonic know the plan better than we do and so this re-education and realignment of our whole life into the design of God which means that our day starts at night mm -hmm. and preparing for that and I think you know when let's say you have fear about losing your job you know you haven't you didn't get a good review so you're going to bed and you you've just been holding this in you haven't even talked to your spouse about it what if you took time before you actually turned out the light and you conversed with Father God and you said, God, I'm afraid I'm going to lose my job. And you were able to hear God and hear God say, you don't need to be afraid. I'm going to give you favor. I'm actually going to promote you and you took that truth from God and then you allowed yourself to imagine what would it look like in my job if I actually got a promotion and so you go to bed not with the fear but with your mind filled with imagination which is faith mm -hmm. in action of what it's going to look like and then Ephesians the scripture says that God, has, who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we could ask or think. So as I go to sleep, I say, God, I have imagined the best case scenario. Now, as I sleep, would you show me your best case scenario and what you plan on doing in my job situation? What a better way to sleep than to go to bed holding on to the fear. What if we gave God the fear before we went to sleep? 
You know, as you're talking, I did a keyword search on mourning <clears throat> in the Bible. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting is here's the promise, some of the promises we have. Every morning the Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases for compassion never fails. Joy comes in the morning. If we already have these promises from God of he's already secured the morning for us, mm -hmm. then truly we need to devote the night to him. He's already got the morning. Right. Why does he say joy comes in the morning? Because he met us in the night because we prepared the way for him at night. Mm -hmm. So this idea of prayer at night, reading your Bible at night, doing this at night refutes the model we've so given people say you're more alert, you're more aware, and mm -hmm. now takes it says, what if you took this back? Let's take the night back. Let's redeem yeah. the night. God's mm -hmm. already got the day. He says yeah. joy comes in the morning. He's already told you that. So you right. don't have to worry about devoting the morning to him. He's got it. I give right. you, open your eyes, joy comes in the morning. Uh, mm -hmm. The sun does an amazing job. But what's interesting is, as you're talking, I'm hearing the lyrics to Phantom of the Opera. Come to me, I'm the angel of the night. Uh. He's not the angel of the day. He's the angel of the night. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. if he's the angel of the night, then we need to meet him head on, armed and dangerous yes. with the word of God in our hand as mm -hmm. this mighty sword of mm -hmm. this two edged sword that will cut and divide even to the marrow. As mm -hmm. we look at this, this is a revolutionary concept that if we take the night back from the enemy, mm -hmm. that we use this light almost this lightsaber. We become the Jedi master of the night using yes. a lightsaber to reach into the corners, the little resources and illuminate with the word of God, speak mm -hmm. to it and tell it to come out. Come mm -hmm. out into the light, come out of the hidden places. Now I'm gonna deal with it in the conscience so that when I go into the subconscious realm, I don't have these things interfering. Mm -hmm. What a great prescription faith, Dr. Sleep. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, this is fascinating. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is the thing. It's not some new, new age idea or some new added thing to Scripture. It's just, it's already been, it's in the Word of God. It is that God is breathing on this. He is opening it up like a treasure out of a treasury vault it's been locked up for whatever reason and I think we're on the verge of some incredible transformation in the world as people take back their nights dreams are so important so incredibly important in God's economy what is it about dreams? What, what is different in our sleep with the visions God give us, gives us during our waking moments? What's different, Faith? Well, I think one thing that's different is focus and lack of distractions. Mm. Because in the daytime, it's, it's not that we're actually double-minded or anything. It's just we have a job to do we have responsibilities you know i'm responsible for my children i'm responsible to you know, not be looking on the computer at facebook or on my phone i'm supposed to be doing my work well i think god honors the responsibilities that he's assigned to us sometimes he honors them more than we do by saying okay I'm not going to distract you by giving you some open vision which causes you to neglect your child who's just about to fall into the pool he waits until the children are asleep I don't have any assignment from my boss and he has our undivided attention and so it is the intensity of the focus. It's like if you're trying to watch a movie in your home 
and there's lots going on, you don't get the full impact of the movie as much as if you've gone to the theater. And that's all there is to do. The phone's not ringing. The kids aren't crying. It's just you're focused on that huge screen, and you get the full impact. And that is what a dream at night is like. It's the full impact. You know, the IMAX movie on the screen of your brain. So the visions we have during the day, which might be fleeting, might be quick and just uh, uh, here and then gone. Mm -hmm. Our dreams are in living color. Our dreams are a longer duration and oftentimes there is a message or a revelation to be gained from that. Mm -hmm. And it could very well be for those that have fear and anxiety, it could be a vision of their fear. Uh, you know, f for example, I'm in media. We always have a certain fear of, are we truly walking with the Lord in such a way that we're exemplifying that in everything we do? Is mm -hmm. my flesh getting involved? Um, most people in media in, uh, you know, w we, almost a fear of being exposed because we're all hypocrites. We're all walking out our salvation with fear and trembling. Uh, people hold us to a high standard and we know that we fall short. So when we do fall short, is it is everybody watching when we fall short? So, mm -hmm. you know, dreams sometimes parallel that and you find mm -hmm. yourself in your dreams in difficult situations where you feel exposed. Um, mm -hmm. that's a, it, it's not a recurring thing, but it happens periodically that you struggle with that. You know, there's a certain, uh, it, it's hard because mm -hmm. ministry and media, you're mm -hmm. in a double glass house and right. you're getting fired at from every direction. And then when you put out editorial comments or you put out position statements and you lead with that, you have this other attack right. coming. Um, and, uh, you know, we all have history, we all have mistakes, we all have errors in our life, we all mm -hmm. came from somewhere, we're overcomers by the word of our testimony and the blood of the right. Lamb. Uh, you know, so that's, that's something that, that, that happens and that's real and that's important that we mm -hmm. face those fears or those insecurities. Uh, right. But, but God is, it does work in that way and there are messages that God has waiting for people and yes. imagine if you put your head on the pillow and said uh, your last words at night of affirming say God uh, let me go to sleep so I might meet you where you want me where you mm -hmm. can r reach me yes help me to receive what you would have for me in this wonderful night's sleep mm -hmm. uh, when I first came to the Lord, I would sleep with the Bible on my head. <laughs> I wanted nothing. It was almost like an aluminum hat. I wanted right. no, nothing to come in but the Absolutely. Word of God. I thought that yes. was, uh, you know, the, the washing of your, of your mind um, with the Word. Um, Faith, do me a favor. Would you pray for our audience that is struggling with sleep and insomnia and fear mm -hmm. and anxiety and kind of prepare them for tonight. Yes. So, Father, we thank you that over and over in your word, you tell us as your children, fear not. And that's 24-7. It's not just fear not in the day. It's to fear not at night. And I pray for all of those watching or who will watch this, that starting tonight they will be able to go to bed with the awareness that you are with them just as a parent a loving parent would be present with a child who was experiencing fear that our father not only will be with us but has already said don't worry about the future 
Don't worry about the dark. Don't worry about all the things that are happening around you. I'm with you. And I pray that the that Emmanuel, God with us, will become such a reality for everyone who is watching this program that their night will suddenly become the thing they can't wait for. They are going to start early, go to bed earlier, just because it's in the night that they have had this experience of deep peace and security with their Heavenly Father. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen and amen. Faith Blatchford, author of Winning the Battle for the Night. Thank you so much for being with us. For our audience, you can order that book right online at ignitingnation.com. Click on Books and Media and scroll down the page and find Winning the Battle for the Night. Faith will be back with us on October the 30th at this hour, 12 o'clock p.m. Central Time, as we have her on every month to talk to us about sleep, dreams, and revelation, winning the battle for the night. Faith Blatchford, thank you so much for being with us here on Revealing the Truth. We look forward to seeing you next month right here, same time, different day, but the last Monday of the month. God bless you, my friend, and thank you for sharing with us here on Revealing the Truth. We're going to take uh, this time to thank our audience for tuning in to our live broadcast today. This brings to a conclusion our live broadcast day, but does not mean we go off the air, for we broadcast 24 hours a day, seven days a week. The replays of today's programs will continue to run all the way until 9 a.m. Central Time tomorrow morning when we're right back here in the studios in Birmingham, Alabama at the Igniting a Nation Broadcasting Network, home of Revealing the Truth. You can catch our replays on our YouTube channel and now on WNDTV. We thank all of our partners, Baker Books, Chosen Books, Revel uh, Books, and all of those who have contributed to this program with great authors like Faith Blatchford. We thank you for your partnership and your friendship. And until we see you right back here tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock a.m. Central Time for the Prophecy Teaching at 9 o'clock and the interviews at 10, 11, and 12 o'clock, we bid you shalom.